Welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study. We are so thankful that you are here again today. Fellas, uh, welcome in the room. Let's make a note right out of the gate so I don't forget it. Because uh, some of you may be catching the archive today, but you normally are in the room with us. But even if you're watching, you still want to know this or listening uh, to the audio archive. Next Wednesday, I will not be here. I will be on vacation uh, all next week. So there will be no Wednesday Bible study, no new one uh, coming up on next Wednesday. So the next uh, live Bible study uh, will be uh, Revelation chapter 6. And that will be two weeks from today. Now, remember, that gives you a great opportunity uh, to go to our archives and go pick up maybe if you've missed some Bible studies in this series, which is the Revelation. If you've missed some of these, go catch up. That'd be a great time to do that because you're not going to miss one next week uh, because uh, there won't be a new one. So that'll give you time to catch up, or you can go back into standalone Bible studies or or other series that you might be interested in. Rick, where can I find those archives? I'm glad you asked. Go to themanchurch.com, and you'll see at the top, Media. Click on Media, and it'll drop down. It'll ask, do you want to listen to it? That'd be the audio archives, or do you want to watch it? That'd be the YouTube archives. So that's where you find them. So make a note, uh, one week from today, which today's the, if you're watching this and listen to it live, it's the 15th. So the 22nd, there will be no new Bible study. But on the 29th, there will be. Okay, you got it? So make a note of that. And I was telling the guys in the room, don't come over here one round parking lot uh, because, uh, you know, it'll be fun, some good exercise, but we won't have a Bible study. So uh, also, the other thing I want to make you aware of that you can get on your calendar, or maybe you haven't done this, if you go to themanchurch.com, you'll notice top of the page you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and and Facebook. If you're not doing that, I would suggest that you do that uh, because uh, uh, Helmsy, who works with our team, and Adler, who works with our team, they put out little excerpts from Bible studies. They let you know what's going on with the different man churches. So there's all kinds of information that you get there that you may not get in the Bible study or you don't get on the Rick and Bubba show. So it's just specific to themanchurch.com. So follow us on social media, too, and uh, you'll notice it's a good follow. So so we'll do that. Some things that we need to let you know about, some man churches that are coming up. The men's discipleship strategy from themanchurch.com is ready for churches to plug in, uh, and you can go there right now. We have a, a, a three curriculum that are 40 weeks. We have a fourth one coming out in April, uh, and you you can put your men in those small groups. We provide the curriculum for you. Uh, if you'd like for our men to come and do events or man church services for you, that's the high challenge part. We do that. And then our curriculum, our high equipping. Then we have resources that are for individual men. Now, I will say this for the ladies who watch this Bible study. A lot of you are asking me about this. It's our latest resource. It's a 31-day devotional called Transform, Embracing the Death of Self and the Power of God. I got probably my, my best endorsement today from my wife, Sherry. Uh, she said, I have finally been sitting and reading this. And she said, you know what? I have taught you well. So I said, yes, you have. So thank you, baby. Uh, But anyway, this is uh, 31 challenging verses that deal with, you know, what Scripture says about the power of Jesus. Women, you have been asking, is this just for men? And the answer is no, it's not. Uh, Men are women. Uh, will benefit from this. This is nothing but a study of the Word of God. There may be some examples in my testimony on the commentary that apply more to men, sh- certainly, but it's good for y'all to know more about us anyway. Uh, but this this is not a men's only resource. This is for anybody. Uh, and it's available now at themanchurch.com uh, in our store. You can also get it at burgessministries.com uh, as well. So that's uh, that's available to you. So all that can be found at themanchurch.com. A couple of man churches this week. I got emails again this week. Do y'all have a list of all the churches that are doing your discipleship strategy? We don't because it's complicated uh, the way these downloads are done. It's hard to figure out sometimes the person who got it for the church, what church do they belong to. We have some idea, but compiling that list is difficult. But one way to know is if there's a man church near you. If you go to that service, boom, you can plug right into the discipleship strategy there too. Uh, Finger, Tennessee, F-I-N-G-E-R. Uh, they're doing their next man church with us. They're doing the strategy. Old Friendship Baptist Church, Friday night, March the 17th. Andy Blanks will be there. You can go join them. Scott Garoski will be in Athens, Georgia, coming up on March the 26th. They're continuing the strategy. You can plug in there. Uh, on April the 14th, I'm excited. I'm going to Omaha, Nebraska. 
Uh, they've been doing the men's discipleship strategy at Westside Church, uh, and churches are coming from all around. We're going to do a little two-day deal there on Friday and Saturday. I'll be speaking actually on the 15th of uh, April, uh, which will be that Saturday. Uh, it'll start on the 14th. I'm going to try to get there by the 14th, but I'm having to fly commercial, so I don't have a whole lot of confidence in that. Uh, but uh, I basically left a day early to try to get there on the day I'm supposed to be there. Uh, that's, uh, so that's coming up on April the 14th. So you can see that. And for those of you that would like to see my wife Sherry and I together for a marriage conference, I get that a lot. We're doing one down in uh, Brandon, Florida, coming up on April the 21st. It'll be at Bell Shoals Church. Uh, both of us will be there. We'll do a one-day marriage conference. We'll do uh, three different sessions. Uh, I'll do one, Sherry will do one, and we'll do one together. And if you would like to be part of that, go to rickandbubba.com or burgessministries.com, and you'll find it for April the 21st. So there you go. We are in the Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter 5 today. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and let's jump right in. Lord, thank you for today. So excited about this today. So much, so much, so much, so much. What, what, what a great day of worship we are about to have uh, here within the room and then uh, all over the world through these, uh, this technology that you have allowed us to have access to in this time to advance your kingdom. Be with us, Lord, as we unpack this, and, and may, we, we, may we glean from this what you expect us to uh, as we see this incredible vision that you allowed John to share with us. In your holy name we pray, amen. So here we are in Revelation chapter 5. So so coming off 4 last week, which was a great, great day. If you missed last week, please go get the archive. Man, we, we, had, we had church in here, and we're going to have it again today. So this is going to be the vision of the Lamb. So, so John, has, he's, he's now he's left taking and dictating these letters to the churches that, that Jesus told him, we've done that. Then he, what Jesus said, come here, I want to show you the third heaven. He's now been ushered into the, to where he can see the throne of God. And last week, all the things that he saw and this, this worship that is going on, well, now we move into five, and the, the vision of the Lamb. And, and uh, this is some commentary uh, that, uh, that I read, and this was so good uh, from John MacArthur. Listen to this. He said, throughout history, there have been pretenders to the earth's throne who have sought to conquer and rule the world. The first and most powerful, of course, was what? Right out of the gate, Satan. And I had somebody question me even at my home church this week saying, we're back in on Genesis, and you know, you're talking about there that Satan took a third of the angels. And for some reason there was discussion, which I don't know where this came from, that they didn't think angels were allowed to make a choice. And I, and I know the confusion, what you are confused on, angels have no shot at redemption. We do which makes it very perplexing that God gave us a, a, an opportunity to be redeemed. He didn't offer them that. Of course they have the ability to make a choice because Satan made one. Lucifer is nothing but a, a powerful angel, and he chose uh, to rebel against God. So, of course, the, the third that went with him had the choice to go with him. So you know, that's absolutely biblical. Uh, but anyway, so we, we've had these people who've tried to conquer uh, and, and rule the world, and, of course, Satan himself, um, you know, Lucifer, uh, was the first to try that. Uh, after his rebellion against God uh, w was crushed, uh, he and his angelic followers were then thrown out of heaven. You can see that in Luke 10, 18. Uh, we're going to see it in the future as we continue the revelation in Revelation 12. And, um, and then when that happened, this is important because that's going to make this vision make sense to us, so stay with me right here. Don't miss this. Little God, with the, I mean with the little G. When Satan was thrown out of heaven because of his attempted overthrow, he became, little g, the god of this world. Okay? He, 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 he has power over this fallen earth. Okay? Hang on to that. And so you'll see that if you want a reference in the New Testament. Uh, it's, uh, we, didn't, we haven't studied this one yet. We did the first letter to the church at Corinth. We've never studied the second one. Maybe we need to. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 talks about this. So now that he was thrown into dominion over a fallen world, which, by the way, he took away that dominion from Adam and Eve, and he did it. He, he pulled it off, which is going to, again, to the vision today. 
Well, then he began to inspire others to also try to rule the earth. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Alexander the Great, uh, Attila, uh, Attila the Hun, uh, all the emperors of Rome. You've heard us mention them. Genghis Khan, Napoleon, uh, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler. Uh, and in the future will, will come uh, the next powerful Satan-possessed human conqueror. You know who that's going to be. He'll be the final one, the Antichrist. So, so there's, there's another one coming, and it's going to be a biggie. Okay, uh, and of course, um, all these, uh, or you know, they they did have one thing that's in common, and this is what we have to celebrate: that, that all these people I just mentioned, including the one that's going to ultimately try it again, they all have one thing in common: they failed. They failed, and 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 we're going to see today there is only one who has the right, the power and authority to rule the earth, only one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He will one day, which we're going to see this future event, we're going to see it today, he will one day take back what is rightfully his from the usurper, Satan himself, and all those who rebel with him. Now listen, this is important. All those who rebel, some of you watching and listening, are part of this group. I was once part of this group. All those who rebel, every rebel, demonic, that's the third of the angels that went with him, and human, those who rebel against him to this day. All the human beings that are not redeemed will face the same wrath and destruction as Satan and his demonic rebels, and all of them will be destroyed, and they'll be eradicated, and the new heaven and the new earth will be established. And there's only one that's going to do it, and we're going to see that today. So Revelation 5 introduces Jesus Christ as earth's rightful ruler who is pictured about to return, to return and redeem the world completely from sin, from Satan, from eternal death, from the curse that sin brought upon us when we failed God in the garden and Satan rightfully, he did it. He went in and he he legally took it away and Jesus again will be the central theme of giving it back. And that's beautiful. That's where we are. So in Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse 1, Listen to what John sees. All John has seen in chapter 4 is going on, so keep that in mind. Go back to 4. We see the four creatures. We see the 24 elders. He's still seeing all that, okay? So, uh, but, he, but, but this crowd's about to get bigger. So John has seen all this. It's still going on, and God begins to stir. He's looking at that throne, and God begins to stir, and, I, and, and you see this, then... I saw. Then I saw. What does that mean? We can't lose this because John's a reliable source. Remember, he talked about this in his epistle. And first, John, when he keeps telling this church that's being duped by the Gnostics, and they're trying to say something about Jesus, and what did John come back and say? I was an eyewitness. I was there. You're going to listen to people that weren't there? I was there. I touched him. I heard him talk about in John 15, if he abides in us and we abide in him, he will produce fruit in us uh, that, that brings glory to his Father, proving that we're his disciples. Don't let these Gnostics tell you that Jesus can't transform you. That's really what he's talking about in 1 John. Well, here, once again, you know what he's telling all of us that are now reading his revelation? I saw it. I'm, I, I am a reliable witness. I saw it. And then what he sees, he says, Then I saw in the right hand of him, God himself, who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So here's the vision that John is trying to get to us as best he can. Listen to this. God seems to be stretching out his hand, which holds a book. Now, the book here... It's not. It's not this. It, it's. It's not looking up and where did I put the, the the the. Here it is. 
It's not this. I'm holding up uh, those of you that are listening only. It's not a book like this. That's not what he's doing. Don't, don't see God holding out a book like we're accustomed to. What the word here in Greek really represents is a scroll. Okay, what, what, what John sees is a scroll. Picture a scroll being handed out. And, and he says that um, it, 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 the Romans, when, they, when the Roman had a will that they had where all their stuff was supposed to be given, where all their property is supposed to be divided up, who's supposed to get what, every one of those were like the scroll, and they were sealed with, with, the, with, the, with seals. Uh, and this one has seven seals, uh, but this scroll is not a will. The scroll that John sees is more like a deed. It's, it's, it's a contract. Uh, and these were very common um, contracts and deeds. When things were agreed on, they would all say, this is the contract we agree on. This is the deed to the property, just like we have now. And they would take it and they would fold it in a scroll and they'd seal it uh, with seven seals to hold it. So the scroll that John saw in God's hand is the title deed to the earth. This is it. And he's holding it out with his right hand, meaning what? The earth needs to be brought back. It needs to be bought back. And here it is. Whoever can open this scroll is the only one that can redeem the earth. This is the only one that can redeem the lost. I'm holding it out, and I want to know who's worthy to open it. And John is watching this. The scroll that he saw in God's hand is that title deed to the earth, which he will give to Christ. This, however, it's 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 a little. As you're looking at it, when when you see this, it's a little different because it. And we got to get this right. Do not see this like you would see me saying to my children. You inherit this. That's not what's happening here because that's not who Jesus is. Jesus don't have to inherit anything, okay? What we're seeing here, this is a little bit different, not like the Romans and the way they did it. What we're seeing is God the Father is holding this out to Jesus because it, he, he is going to regain what was already rightfully his. See, that's a little different than your daddy giving you something that you didn't earn. He, this has always been his. And since Satan came in and corrupted it through human beings being fooled into sinning against God, now a perfect holy God has to move away from that and start the plan of redemption. That's why the whole Bible is about Jesus. Because this plan that, that John is now seeing the fulfillment of it, the final, he sees it. Oh, this moment that he's about to have is, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. So this is going to take place by means of divine judgment to be poured out on the earth. And we're going to see this in chapter 6, okay? So remember, it, it is a, it's a scroll, but it's both a scroll, and we can never forget this. You've heard me mention this about the cross. It's both a scroll of doom and judgment, but at the same time, it's a scroll of redemption. Now, what do I mean by that? It's the same thing looking at the cross. Scripture tells you this. If you look at the cross and you repent of your sin and you say, Jesus has paid the price that I should have paid, this gory wrath of God the Father is being poured out on God the Son. It should have been poured out on me because he is righteous. He is perfect. He is unblemished. I, however, are sinful. I should be on the cross. He went to the cross for me, and I look at that, and I say, I repent. And then he rises on the third day, and he says, I've defeated sin. I've defeated eternal death. And I say to him, I repent. Please save me. I leave faith in myself. I put my faith in you because only you, Jesus, can make me fully righteous. And I not only believe that historically, I leave faith in self. I place faith in you. And I now have faith in action. I am seeking your redemption. You will give it to us who seek your redemption. And I acknowledge that you and you alone make me fully righteous. And I turn from sin and I turn to you and the sincerity of my heart that only God and I know. I might say I did that, but if you don't see the fruit of it in my life, I was probably lying. And God knows the sincerity of my heart. 
and those that are sincere he redeems. But if I reject the cross, if I say there's many ways to heaven, if I say I will not repent, I will stay in my sin, and I'll pick my sin over you, that cross represents judgment because that was my only shot to be redeemed. And I rejected it. So now I die with Satan and the demons. So this scroll for the redeemed is great news. For the, re- for the rebels, it's bad news. And, 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 and this is that part that I think that some of us, and it, it, was, it took me a while to get there too. And I had somebody call the show about it about three weeks ago. And they asked that question. How can there be no sadness, no mourning in the final heaven and in the new earth? And we've talked about this. If people that I know rebelled against Christ. And you're going to see it here today. When we're finally in his presence. We will celebrate the destruction of all who rebel against him. It don't matter who they are. These kind of relationships that we cling to here on this earth, these are not the real deal. It's just like when Jesus tried to get cornered, and I know some of us don't like some of this. If you're being honest, but you better like it because it's going to be better than anything else you could ever think of because that's that faith again. When they try to corner Jesus on the seven brothers who all married the same woman to redeem her, whose wife is this going to be in heaven? And Jesus laughs it off. (laughs) That's the kind of relationships you're talking about on earth. You ain't going to care about that at all in heaven. We don't play those kind of games in heaven. That's all stuff we needed for the earth. You'll know who everybody is, but you are not going to be concerned at all about how many brothers redeemed some woman out of something y'all did on earth. That didn't happen in the in new heaven and the new earth. So something has been lost to mankind and the earth that is to be redeemed. The all dominion, you remember our study on Genesis, which is why my wife was correct. You can't teach the end if they don't know the beginning. Here it is, another example of that. You don't even know what's going on here if you don't know the beginning. You don't have any idea what this is about. But now that we know the beginning, and those of you who didn't come to that Bible study, I hope you all know. Okay, it's there. But Adam and Eve had been given dominion over the earth, and Satan took it away from them. He tricked them by saying what? Is that what God really said? You think it's important for us to know the Bible? You think it's important for us to know God's Word? You don't think he stopped doing that, do you? He did it to me. Yeah, I don't think I'm supposed to have sex with anybody but my wife. Is that what God really said? Don't you love this girl? So he don't want you to have sex with somebody you love? Why does she have to be your wife? That's just paperwork. That's just that's just a contract. It's just so much a piece of paper don't change anything. Is that what God really said? Go ahead and have sex with her. That's pro- it's probably who you're going to marry anyway. Go ahead and live together. Y'all going to end up getting married anyway. God understands all that. Is that what he really, would he really say, only have sex with your wife, really? I mean, look at society. Nobody cares about that anymore. God's trying to keep you from having, he don't want you in on this. He ain't never changed his tactics. And I know I'll, I'm one sitting here included. I, I was fooled by that. And I bet a lot of people in this room were fooled by it too. Right? And, then, and what, what God's saying is not only did I want that to be done inside of marriage for your sake, I wanted that for her sake because you didn't marry her and now you've sold somebody else's wife. I wasn't trying to keep anything from you. I was trying to bless you. My boundaries were a blessing and Satan convinced you that they weren't. And that's what he did to Adam and Eve. And we've been doing it ever since. He hasn't changed his tactic. So you better know what God said, and you better be sold on what God said so he can't talk you out of it. Or your flesh can't talk you out of it. And so so now here's this scroll that, that actually at one time belonged to Adam and Eve. Now it's been lost to Satan, and God's putting out that deed. He's saying, who can redeem it? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says what? We are sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise. Those seals on there. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Romans 8, 22 and 23 says what? The whole earth groans. Not only the earth, but also we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters to the redemption of our bodies. It's like John, you're going to see in a minute, he's looking at that and he said, we're all groaning for this. The whole earth is groaning for this. We want to be redeemed. We want all this made right. And John sees it, and you can just see him almost leaning in. You're going to see him in a minute going, come on. Who's worthy? Redeem us. The whole earth, remember in Romans, it's groaning. When we walk up, the earth even starts looking and saying, are you one of them? Are you one of the sons of God? When is this all going to be made right? And I want you to think about what it's going to be when it's made right. I stood at the Continental Divide. I've told some of y'all this. Bubba and I are standing there, my radio partner. We're both there together. And we're, we can't believe what we're seeing. Some of y'all been there. And Bubba uttered so much truth. He said, and this is his throwaway. He's going to burn every bit of this because it's fallen. This is fallen? It's fallen. Can you imagine Go ahead and cling to this place and die with it. The rest of us are moving on to something better. This ain't heaven. This is fallen and it's going to burn. Every bit of it's going to burn. Ezekiel 2, let's turn over to that. Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10. Flip over to that real quick. Ezekiel sees the exact same thing. Look in chapter 2 of Ezekiel. And this look at uh, verses 9 and 10. Look what Ezekiel sees. Does this sound like Revelation 5? And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back. And there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Now, why does Ezekiel see that? Because this scroll is judgment. Because how's the world going to be redeemed? Through judgment, through refinement. And, Zachar- and uh, Ezekiel is seeing the exact same thing. It sounds identical to what John is seeing. Now we move to the next thing that John sees. And this is when it's going to, hey, we're about to, if we just have to stop and just weep and shout and scream, we'll do it. Next, the question is asked. Where is the one who's worthy to open the scroll? Verse 2, and I saw a strong 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 angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. I saw a strong angel. The Bible doesn't name the angel. We don't know who this is. Somebody says, well, they're proclaiming it's got to be Gabriel. We don't know. It's Michael. We don't know. We're not told. Okay? All we know is he says it's a strong angel, and it's a loud voice that, that, that penetrates every corner of the earth, and the angel is seeking someone both worthy and able to open the book and break its seal. And this is, what, these are, this is what this question means. Who has the power to defeat Satan? Who has the power to defeat his demons? Who has the power to wipe out sin and its effects, which are eternal death? Who can reverse the curse on all the creation? And the angel's shouting it. And it says that it's penetrating and loud. Can you imagine what that was like for John? He's just, and it's loud, screaming it. Who is worthy? Who is worthy? And and, and then you'll see what happens to John in four. A silence is allowed. He doesn't get an answer quickly. And listen to what happens. Verse four. 
And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and look into it. Do you, do you find that interesting since John actually walked with Jesus, knew that he was crucified, and spent 40 days with him after he rose, and is the only living disciple, apostle? Why is he weeping? Doesn't he know? But see, that's us, isn't it? No one was able. They could not do it. No one qualified. The word here, John is overwhelmed. He weeps. Clio is the Greek word here. It's the same word in Luke 19, 41. It's the same in Matthew 23, 37, when Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. Same word. Luke twenty two sixty two. 62, Peter weeping after he denied and betrayed Jesus. That This is strong. It's unrestrained emotion. And it's the only time, oh, this is good. It's the only time we see tears actually in heaven. Because he's been invited in. And he's weeping loudly. W.A. Criswell says this. Here's what John's tears represent represents God's people throughout centuries. It represents Adam and Eve when they were driven out of the garden. The first time that they bowed over to the very first grave that they dug for their son, Abel. And they realized the earth has fallen now. We're bearing a son. And as their tears hit the dirt, these are the tears that John is crying. The children of Israel crying in bondage all of us who have stood by open graves, been through trials, sufferings, heartaches, disappointments, the curse of this at times beautiful creation. And if we were honest, every one of us has said, where is our Redeemer? Come get us, Jesus. My body's getting old. I'm sick. My daddy doesn't even know who we are anymore. I've buried another person. Come get us. Where's our Redeemer? And that's what John is saying. He knows what's going to happen. He's just ready for it to happen. Think about what they've been through. They've killed all of them, Jesus. I'm the only one left. I'm out here at Patmos. They've already tried to boil me in water. They've tried to kill me. I've been beaten. When are you coming to get us? I see the Father holding out the scroll. I know that, that you're going to redeem. Come redeem us. You ever cried that cry? I have. Come get us. Where is the Redeemer? John was sincere, but praise God he was premature because next comes the selection of the worthy one. And John can tell us it's going to happen because he's seen it. Verses 5 through 7. And one of the elders, I wonder which one it was, one of the elders says to me, Weep no more. I mean, he's saying to John, hey, 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 don't weep. Stop it. Weep no more. Listen, look at me. Listen to me right here on the camera. Weep no more. These elders might as well be reaching, that elder might as well be reaching down to you and me. Hey, Rick, hey, Rick, it's going to be all right. John 16, 33. Get the joy back in your heart because he's overcome the world. Weep no more. The Redeemer's here. He's coming. And here's what he says. Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain 
with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. John is corrected by one of the elders, weep no more. And he points John to see, look, there's a new person emerging on the scene. The lion that is from the the tribe of Judah, the root of David. No human and no angel can redeem the universe, but he can, the Lord Jesus Christ, the line of Judah, Jacob's blessing, Genesis 49, 8 through 10. That's why we studied the beginning. Hebrews 7, 14 also speaks to this. uh, uh, and, And the Jews expected the way Jesus is now would be the way he would come first, and they missed the timetable. But it's here now. The root of David, descendant from the line of David, Isaiah 11, 1, Matthew 1 with all the genealogies, Luke 3 does it too. They all show you that uh, the line of David takes us to Messiah. And even, even when, you, when you look, when, when Jesus, the human baby, was in the womb, both his, his earthly mother and his earthly father, they both came from the line of David. Son of David is a messianic title throughout the New Testament. Jesus has conquered, and we are told he has overcome he has defeated sin. Romans 8, There is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Colossians 2, 15. 1 Peter 3, 19. And it just goes on and on. We who have been redeemed are also overcomers and the conquerors that Jesus talked about on the seven letters to the church. You also see this in Colossians 2, 13 and 14, if you want to write that down. And I mentioned John's epistle, 1 John. It's in 1 John 5, 5. And and when he sees him, he's between the four living creatures, and it's a lamb. He, He was the first. He's the lamb of God. That, that, that John the Baptist, when he looks up and he sees, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, John now sees that Lamb. He probably expects to look up there and see a lion, but he sees a lamb. The word here is arnion, which means a little pet lamb. Now, where does that come from? That was a requirement for the Passover lamb. See all this? Everything's about Jesus. God... In Exodus 12, 3 through 6, write that down, Exodus 12, 3 through 6, before the Passover lamb was sacrificed, God required that they kept it in their house and became attached to it so it would be sacrificial. See, a lot of us, as C.S. Lewis called out, we want the crown, but we don't want the cross. We want to bypass the cross and get to the crown. Now, Jesus didn't do that, but somehow we think we should. Okay, and, and we, don't want, we don't want our redemption to cost us anything. We don't want it to cost us our sin. We don't want it to cost us our friends. We don't want it to cost us a family member. We don't want it to cost us our job. Jesus, we appreciate what you did, but just don't require anything from us. We know you had to suffer, but not us. We know the first church suffered, but not us. I know people have to suffer, but not me. And if that's the road, deny myself and pick up my cross, I'm out. Well, let me tell you, when God's judgment comes down on on the earth, you losing a friend or losing a job ain't going to seem like much. That would have seemed like a mild sacrifice to stand with Jesus. And I stand with Jesus against all who oppose him. Everybody. Everybody. And, but he, he sees this now, and he realizes this is no ordinary lamb. First of all, let's look at the obvious. John sees it standing on its feet. Yet it's also looking as if it has been slain. He sees it's wounded mortally, but it's still alive. It seems to have been attacked, but survived. And so what you, and then he's thinking, 
So a lamb is going to take on a dragon? This is what's going to defeat Satan? A lamb? It has seven horns. Horns in Scripture always symbolize strength and power. Seven, as we know, is God's favorite number. It's the number of perfection. And what what he is seeing is God is saying clearly through the seven horns, this lamb has absolute power. He's undefeatable. His strength is perfect. Then he sees the seven eyes. He has complete, without error, he is, uh, he has, he's omniscient, he's, uh, he has complete understanding, he has complete knowledge. Perfect strength, perfect knowledge, perfect wisdom, perfect understanding. He is perfection. He is fully righteous. John notes the eyes represent also what? The seven spirits. We talked about this. That God has sent out into all the earth. This is the perfection and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. This has already been explained uh, in chapter 1 and chapter 4. This is the Holy Spirit in all his fullness. Remember what he said to, to the apostles? It's good that I go. Because what I'm about to pour out on you now is going to be a game changer. Now, we foolishly compare ourselves to them before the Holy Spirit as if we don't have access to it. And, it, and you know what? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, yeah, you're right. You probably you ain't got a chance. But what we ought to do, if you claim to be redeemed, and I do claim to be redeemed, I'm supposed to compare myself to how the Holy Spirit affected them. And let me tell you something. They're a much higher standard then because they now have the power of the Holy Spirit, which everybody who is redeemed also has. So if you don't see yourself looking like them after the Holy Spirit, it may be that you don't have it. And I'd be real concerned about that if you haven't seen that transformation power because he certainly does provide it. And, of course, um, we we, we see here that, uh, as in chapter 4, when he sees this, it also represents judgment, these eyes. They're searching for the guilty. They're searching for the unrepentant. They are searching for the sinner's that are going to be judged. And if you want a reference point on that, go to the Gospel of John 16, 8. John 16, 8. And then verse 7. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, the final monumental act in the heavenly scene. This act will signal the end to man's day to Satan, and it represents full redemption is about to be seen, paradise will be regained. We're going back to the garden. It's going to be set right. The Lamb took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. Turn with me to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Look what Daniel sees in Daniel 7, verses 13 through 14. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. This is what John's seeing. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, uh, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. John is seeing all this coming to fulfillment. The worthy one has arrived to take back what has always been rightfully his. He's taking it back, and only he can do it. Praise his holy name. He is worthy. Have you ever heard that song, Is He Worthy? He is. He is. So what happens next? What do you think ought to happen? Celebration, baby. Here we go. So then now John sees the celebration that erupts after this moment in verses 8 through 14, the song of the worthy one. So look what happens in 8. And we had, when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, underline new song. 
They sing a new song. All hymns are new at some point. Would we go as far as to say this was a contemporary hymn? Nobody had heard this one before. Okay, so here we go. Worthy are, are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, and for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, and from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That sounds an awful lot like what Daniel saw. Okay? And how many years before John gets this vision is Daniel seeing the same thing? A bunch. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels. Underline that. The crowd's getting bigger. Numbering myriads. And, and he goes, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, I mean, there is now a, a, just a myriad of them. They're everywhere. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. What a scene, what a scene, what a scene. We now move to praise. It breaks out from everywhere in the universe. It's like, it's like this pent-up anticipation of, of, of that, that, that has been, we've been, been anticipating for millennia finally burst out of the prospect of what is about to take place. The four creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb, same as we see in chapter 4. Listen to what um, Dr. Gary, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Gray Burnhouse said. Four things currently are out of place that are going to be set right. This is good. Four things that are out of place, that the Lamb of God is going to set right. It's, it's going to take, the scroll will set these things right. The church will be where it's supposed to be, in heaven. Israel will be living in peace, occupying all the land promised to her. They don't have it all right now. They've given some of it away. They're going to get it all, and they'll be living at peace. Satan, who belongs in a lake of fire, will be put there. Christ should be seated reigning on his throne, and he will be. All those things are not like they're supposed to be now. The church is not in heaven. Israel is not at peace and does not occupy all the land that was given to her. Satan is not in the lake of fire, and Christ is not seated reigning on his throne yet over the new heaven and the new earth. And you know what the scroll says? It will be now. These four things are going to be set right. And if you're not part of the church, you're not on the list. You're going to be eradicated. Sin's not going to be tolerated anymore. And God is, and my wife pointed this out, I remember the first time she pointed out, we were talking about, because there's things we'll get in the Revelation later, where there continues to be a refinement that's taking place of even the redeemed to a, to a certain level. There, there's testing and testing and testing of the devotion to Jesus. And you know what it is? And, I, and Sherry's 100% right, and I've seen other people who agree, and Scripture seems to point to this. I'm not going into this again with people I can't trust. I'm only going to be with people that I can trust. And they're going to be proven that they're devoted to me. There'll be no more rebellions. And, uh, of course, the removal of Satan and his demons will finally take place forever. So the harp that they have and the golden bowls of incense, the prayers of the saints, the harps, this is just part of Old Testament worship. Uh, it's, it's, it's also closely always tied to prophecy. The golden bowls of incense, they use these in the tabernacle and the temple, always connected to the altar, always connected with priestly work of intercession. Also, the prayers of the saints, write these down. You'll see this, Psalms 141, 2, Luke 1, 9 and 10. Later, we really don't need to write this down because we'll cover it, but if you want to, later, we'll see it in Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4. This represents the prayers of the redeemed throughout the ages, prophesies, etc. 
all of the prayers that have ever been prayed will all be presented before the Lamb, and they all will be fulfilled. Wow. And then they begin to sing the new song, Song of Redemption. And they're likely, the ones who start singing, are likely the elders. And then we walk through this, worthy are you to take the scroll. You know, he's the only one that can open its seals. You were slain by your blood. You ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. But when you look at, if you look at 10, of all these, it's pretty straightforward, but 10 kind of throws you. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. So when you see this, notice that it says you have made them. It doesn't say us. And, and so this is showing the vastness of redemption. All the saints, not just those elders, are part of God's kingdom. Complete access to God's presence, also priest to our God, all the redeemed will be in perfect communion with God during the millennial kingdom, believers will reign upon this earth. So the elders are making clear in the song, it's not just us. You've done this for all the redeemed. And all the redeemed will have the same access to you that we have. Not just us. So all that, all that hierarchy is over now as far as access to God. And, of course, when he talks about how many angels join in, it is an uncountable host. Hebrews 12, verse 1, says the number of the holy angels cannot be counted twice as many, we know, as the fallen, because they're only a third. And we'll see this again in Revelation 12, 3 and 4, if you want to make a note. The number, notice what's happening. When they start singing this song, we go, God, I got the elders singing. I've got the four creatures singing. I've got some angels singing. Oh, there's more angels, and there's more angels. It just keeps growing. More and more and more to John can't even count them. And they're all singing and celebrating. Can you imagine what that's like? In one loud voice, angels that cannot be counted, 24 elders, four living creatures, John is seeing this choir that, that we can't even comprehend, all in one voice saying, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. He can redeem us. He is worthy to receive recognition. What, what for? Well, it tells us. For his power, his riches, he owns it all. His wisdom and omniscience. He is perfection, worthy of all the honor, the glory, and the blessing. He is worthy. We are not. So please stay away from some of this modern, flawed theology that makes you think that God is enamored with you. John is just a spectator. John's worthy of nothing. Can you open the seal? Can you take the scroll? Can you redeem the world? I can't. There's a lot of people strutting around this world right now that really think they're something. They're nothing. Steve Farrar, God rest his soul, he said, Rick, never be concerned with all of these so-called powerful people of the world. Remember that God has to allow them to breathe. You know how quick he could kill everybody in this room? Like that. And if he delays long enough, this room will be filled with other people. We'll all be gone. I, 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 I got into this the other day. I, I would even stay away from this. And this is new that this has been removed. And it's, and it, and it's said in the, in the kindest of ways. A young man and I were talking about it yesterday who I had the honor to mentor. and He's a powerful young man of God. And we were discussing this. There's things 
that God has assigned to you that only you can do? Hogwash. Absolute hogwash. You think God's dependent on us to accomplish what he's going to accomplish? No, his will is something we may get to do, but it ain't something that he's going to wring his hands over if we refuse to do it. He's going to get it done. Okay, I mean, do you think right here somebody runs and says, hey, Rick Burgess didn't do what only God had called him to do. No scroll opening today. Rick ruined this whole thing for all of us. We can't be redeemed because Rick didn't do what only God only called him to do. No, God's called us all to advance his kingdom. If you don't do it, somebody else will. He'll just use somebody else. I want to be part of it, but he doesn't need me to be part of it. So don't anybody put that. If, if, if everybody's redemption is riding on one of us, they got problems. But what he says is, do what I tell you to do if you love me. But I work it all out. I don't need you. I just allow you to be part of it. But you don't make me any more holy. You don't make me any more great. When y'all came on the scene, it didn't change anything about me. You need to realize that I'm the one who changes you. You don't get to change me. I am who I am, whether you repent or not. I'll either redeem you or I'll destroy you. It's your call. But I'm, I'm gracious, and I'm slow to anger. But it doesn't mean that the age of grace lasts forever, and just because I'm slow to anger doesn't mean I don't ever anger. I'm righteous and I'm holy. And I'm going to eradicate sin from this place. So be redeemed. So just as the Passover, the blood on the, of the perfect lamb over the doorpost, you take the blood of my son and you wipe it all over yourself and let it make you fully righteous. Amen. The worship and praise reaches its crescendo. Every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, all things... In them, join in. Psalm 69, 34 says, Let heaven and earth praise him. Psalms 150, uh, verse 6, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. To him who sits on the throne, endless blessing, honor, praise, glory, worship belongs to God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. The creation is unable to contain its joy. The four living creatures could only keep saying, Amen. Let it be. Make it happen. The elders fell down and once again worshiped. Soon, listen to this, and this is how we're going to end today, right on the nose. Listen what's about to happen, and this is where we're about to head in our study. These things are going to happen. All this is going on. All this worship is going on. They're being worked into a frenzy. For what? To hand out judgment. Soon, this mighty host will march out of heaven, gather the church, return with Christ, and he will set up his earthly kingdom. And what John just saw is the stage is set. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what we see. Thank you for inspiring John to get this to us. May we take it very serious. And may we ask a difficult question. Are we going to be gathered to you when this host heads out? Are they coming to get us, Jesus? Are you coming to get us? Are you coming to eradicate us? Today is the day. I, I know there's people listening to this. I know there's people watching this. There may even be men in this room. Please do not do this again. Do not let another day go by. Do not let your flesh or Satan say to you, I know you feel under conviction. I know this has pierced your heart. I know you feel the power of God. Yes, he exists. Yes, you need to repent. Yes, you need to be redeemed. Just not today. No, today's your day. You may not live to see another day. 
God's been gracious enough to allow you this day and put you wherever you are right now to hear this message. He's not going to come and judge the world without proper warning. And you've been warned. And he loves you enough to warn you. Don't be like me. Don't waste years in rebellion against God. Repent today. Turn from your sin. And you turn to God. And just say, forgive me. If your heart's sincere, he will. And then say, now, now transform me. I know you love me, but now teach me to love you. And you seek him, and he will. In your holy name we pray, amen. If you need me, Rick, at BurgessMinistries.com, I'll be happy to help you. Thanks for being with us. No Bible study next week, but we'll be back here on the 29th. Thanks a lot.